if you just want to put your if if you go to uh, there should be a thing that says full screen. Uh, I'm, I think we should start. Um, uh, Tim is now recording. So uh, the first thing we need to say when we're recording, uh, because we're at OCAD, is that uh, we are recording. And if you don't want to be recorded, you should leave now. But we hope that you don't. Um, so this is the um, 86th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, uh, with now uh, rapidly approaching 1,700 uh, members, of which we have a small group a small select group on the on the meeting today, but uh, we're recording so that uh, all the other members can benefit and the slides will be available as well uh, in our Google Drive. Um, so as, as is our custom, just a few uh, introductory words from me, just to set the context, we do have one new member with us today. So you, uh, there's at least one person who hasn't heard this this uh, story before, so uh, uh, that, that's, that's all good. And, and it all changes every month slightly uh, anyway. So first of all, a quick uh, acknowledgement about our privilege. Um, so obviously we're a, a global group. We're in uh, at least two provinces and at least uh, two countries uh, with the people on the call today. So uh, wherever we are, this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. Uh, this land, nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. And we are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honour and respect peoples indigenous to your place. And for some of you, that may be yourselves and in other, for other places, it may not be. And today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to peoples from across the world. And we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. Second uh, is a recognition of the, the place and more of a biophysical uh, perspective as opposed to a social, uh, socio-physical one. And the um, question would be, do you know what watershed you're in? Uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody would, uh, anybody would like to put the answer that into the chat. Do you know which watershed you're in? For those of you who are on the call. I don't even know where I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, you're in you're, 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 <laughs> you're, you're on planet Earth, I can guarantee that. Um, so uh, here, in, so we're, we're actually not in the building that's in the photograph here, but we are um, uh, just down the street from here. Uh, and that means that we're on a, uh, in a watershed known as Russell Creek. Uh, it was known by settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, we don't actually know the indigenous name or I haven't been able to find it out. So if anybody finds that out, I would love to know. Uh, and um, the settlers and hence ourselves buried that to become a sewer in the 1870s because we polluted it so badly. Uh, and so if you think about this session, uh, if you go to the bathroom, and I know some of us did before the session started, we're actually benefiting from uh, the ecosystem service provided by this watershed that we're sitting in. Um, and if you're using the Flourishing Business Canvas, this is why we have biophysical stocks and ecosystem services on the canvas so that you can start to think about how your business is interacting with the place in which you're uh, based and the, and the environment in which you're based. Uh, so uh, we are, as I said, uh, 16, actually 1683, I think, was the number just a moment ago. So uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching uh, 1,700 people. We've added about 70 people or so in the last month. Um, we, are, we claim to be the world's first, maybe only group, uh, taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro-ecological economic perspective. So this is where the strongly sustainable comes from. Uh, we're not about weak sustainability, sustainable development. We're about strong sustainability, flourishing. Uh, we use anticipatory systemic design approaches uh, in all the work that all of our members do. Uh, we have a strong normative purpose, enabling the possibility for flourishing. Um, so hopefully we get you. Uh, this is your, you found your tribe, you found your home uh, for, uh, for, for doing the work that you're doing, which is, which is part of this. Um, and uh, we put into practice and do action research uh, uh, on the latest ideas and we offer a network of possibilities for education, research and employment. Um, I won't go through the goals in, in detail today, uh, they are there. I want to just mention we are evolving the group, we've been a voluntary group since we started in 2012 but we are moving towards becoming a network, a planetary network of nodes forming a flourishing enterprise inter institute with a research community. Uh, we have the uh, founding forum uh, for this in August, uh, held, hosted by uh, Veris out at Wilfrid Laurier University. And uh, we are um, just now looking to find funding to get the next stage of this evolution uh, moving forward. And uh, there'll be more news about that posted to the group in the coming uh, months. Uh, we are um, contributing to a planetary movement towards flourishing enterprises and uh, this set of logos that are appearing here are 
the people we've noticed appear to be uh, part of this movement with us. Some people uh, in this list know that, other people don't. Uh, and uh, so we're um, slowly bringing together these uh, groups and organizations to help us recognize that we are, we are trying to do something together uh, towards the, the goal of flourishing. Um, and of course, we're in sync and going beyond the SDGs. Uh, flourishing is beyond the SDGs, but the SDGs are a very necessary step on that journey. Um, and we have multiple uh, projects of our members, uh, which we collaborate on. And you can learn more about these on our wiki and by contacting any of the people involved in these projects. Um, we also sustain and make uh, communities. Uh, so we've got the uh, R3.0 International Conference, which is going to be next year in June, uh, it, probably in the Netherlands again. Uh, the second International Conference on Sustainable Entrepreneurship. Uh, the first one of those was in uh, Montreal uh, in August, and one of our members, Lockley Belkahiri, organizes that. Uh, we've got um, Florian Ludecker Freud and Christoph Dembeck who have published this lovely article about the whole field of sustainable business modeling, kind of sets, sets up the whole space that we're uh, doing work in. Uh, we've got the Systemic Design uh, Conference, which is the people who are, are designers who are also system thinkers, or are they system thinkers who are also designers. Uh, their, their ninth conference, uh, their eighth one was just in Chicago in the last weeks. The ninth one will be uh, in India next year uh, and um, continuing that uh, tradition. Uh, that's a joint project of OCAD University and uh, Aho uh, School of Architecture and Design in uh, Oslo. Uh, we have um, the New Business Models Blueprint, another piece of infrastructure, conceptual infrastructure for the group that was uh, done by R3.0. Uh, we have the fifth international conference on new business models, which next year will be uh, in uh, the end of June in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Uh, and we have the our blog, Sustainable Business Models, uh, run by Florian and also uh, many of us are involved in the Institute for Revolutionary uh, Leadership and also the B Corp Academic Community Roundtable. So we're working on all those things. Uh, lots of detail about projects in here. I won't go through these in, in any more detail. Um, I'm excited to say that there's a new initiative that a couple of people are interested in moving forward on on uh, measurement. Uh, so I think you can expect a new project of our members or a new initiative of our members uh, starting soon and, and that will be partly described in our January uh, meeting. So we get on to our monthly meetings. We have a meeting every month. Uh, as I mentioned, this is our 86th. These are some recent past meetings um, and um, the purpose of those meetings is for our members to share what they're doing with each other. Uh, sometimes it's on some of our major initiatives. Sometimes it's on things that individuals are working on. Um, in this case, uh, this month, uh, we have, um, oops, I'll skip over this. Uh, I'll skip over this for the time being. Uh, oh, that didn't get updated. This is not this month's meeting. Uh, this month's meeting is with Petra so much from Lisbeth. Uh, Petra is a very long time collaborator. I've known Petra personally since 2011, I think it probably is now. Petra, it's almost 10 years, believe it or not. Um, and um, Petra has been an, an active member of this community uh, since very early days. And um, particularly um, in the last few years focused on um, bringing ideas of feminism into the idea of strongly sustainable uh, and flourishing business. And uh, 18 months ago, one of uh, Petra and our colleagues, uh, C.V. Harquell, uh, presented to the group on the uh, feminist business model canvas. And um, uh, as a, since then, Petra's run uh, two um, major full day, in fact, multi-day workshops on feminist entrepreneurship, feminist business, uh, where CV and others have been involved and there's been quite a lot of development work done on the Feminist Business Canvas and Lisbeth itself has been uh, going from strength to strength in terms of publishing uh, stories and inspiration uh, and ideas around feminist business. So we thought it was time to have Petra back uh, to give us an update on everything that she's been doing and to give us a perspective on uh, where she sees things going uh, next. So uh, with that Petra, let me stop sharing and uh, let you start sharing and uh, hand it over to you. Uh, you have um, about uh, uh, an hour and 15 minutes and you can organize that any way you like. Take questions as you go or at the end, uh, we're, we're in your hands. So please take it away. Okay, so it says I cannot start the screen share while the other person is sharing. So I'm try, try it one more time. I believe I stopped sharing now. Okay, let's try it again. There we go. Yeah, yes. Does it come up? Yep. Okay, wonderful. 
Okay, so first off, uh, thank you, Anthony, and the whole sustainable business model group for having me today. I couldn't be more delighted. I adore what you are doing, the whole group, and I, you know, I've learned a lot from it over the years. And uh, just want to say thank you and, and give some gratitude to Anthony for, and, and of course his colleagues. I know he doesn't build this alone, but uh, it's such an incredibly uh, enormously helpful, useful initiative that has informed a lot of my work in my previous venture, but also the current work that we're doing as well. So I see us as, as colleagues and connected in trying to make the world uh, a better place and to enable flourishing for all. So let me start out, what we're going to talk about for the next hour or so um, is the feminist, you know, basically the things that we've learned through feminism and how they can help us transform business so that it works for everyone. Um, and I know there's uh, some over, like there, obviously our goals are similar, but there's some things that uh, through feminist research, pedagogy, theory over the last 200 years that have been developed that tend to be undermined for its insight just because it, has, it was developed by feminists. And of course, lots of people uh, would not think to look there for uh, amazing ideas around how to encourage flourishing for everyone. So that's what we're trying to surface and uh, in the last couple of years. So what I'm going to do in this presentation, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth. It's going to be a bit of a dialogue as well. So I hope you're ready for that. And my aim is just to help you with some definitions, give you some ideas, and also leave you with some, some uh, thought leaders that I think you should be aware of that might actually be really helpful to the work that you're doing as well. And um, of course, I'm also going to hope that after this presentation that Anthony will include our logo on his list of uh, partners and people, uh, partners in, in uh, helping create a more flourishing, sustainable world. And because I noticed it wasn't on there, Anthony. <laughs> so um, we're going to, ho hopefully you'll be able to. Yes, we, 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 should, we, yeah. should, we should do that. Let, we let, should let's, do that. let's um, um, yeah, yes is the short like answer it. and we'll have, we'll have that uh, beer which we promised each other to uh, organize that, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move right along then. Um, so what I want to start, this is basically what we'll discuss. What is a feminist enterprise? Uh, what is the feminist business model canvas? But I actually, I'm, I'm not going to focus on the canvas because there are many other feminist business tools and uh, frameworks and things like that that entrepreneurs and business leaders can use to get new insight into practices and things that they might be doing to uh, create flourishing for everyone. Um, and then I, I do have a couple of things that, um, that we can report out on and talk about as well. So that's what we're gonna do in the next hour. So the first thing I wanted to start with and I invite the entire audience to think about this is three questions. So the first one is, what is your relationship with feminism? How might feminism have influenced your life? And where do you go to learn about feminism? So I'm just gonna allow the clock to tick for a minute or so and ask you to jot down in your notebooks or whatever, or on your, on your phones, answers to those for three questions. And then I'm gonna circle back and ask you to share if you're open to that. So we'll just take a moment of, of uh, a minute or so of, of reflection time to do that. Petra, can you ask those questions again? Yes, I'm sorry. So they should be on the slide. You, can you see them? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Okay, now that um, I, I know sometimes we leave a little bit more time for this, but um, I think these are really important questions uh, before we get into the broader topic. So let me ask you each maybe to share, and I know I don't, I can't see how many people are there, but let's assume the four of you, um, what, anyone who wants to share, what is, let's tackle the first one first, what is your relationship with feminism? What comes to mind?
Um, I can go first. Okay. Um, so I never thought I had a relationship with feminism because I didn't really understand it um, for many years. Feminism was, uh, for me, something that happened um, kind of many years back in order to bring women up to the same um, kind of status in life and the workplace as men. And we achieved that. And so feminism kind of moving forward was just um, mainly kind of for me a, um, it almost seemed like a kind of angry space that women would engage in um, when they felt that they weren't being treated equally. But I always felt like, like I was treated equally as a woman in business. Um, but I think that's the narrative that many people have. Um, feminists are, are angry uh, people who, um, I mean, I think we lost the don't shave under their armpits a couple of years ago, but um, that, you know, that, that they choose to see um, that women are treated differently, whereas women are actually not treated differently. And, Although I've be always been very pro uh, women's rights, um, I would never have classified myself as a feminist. And as I grew up and started to kind of learn more and started um, to question why things maybe weren't about me, maybe there were some systemic issues um, that I'd taken on board as being my fault, my responsibility, you know, within the workplace, within society, um, starting to read um, more about feminism from uh, women authors, suddenly started to realize, my gosh, actually, wait a second, uh, we're a little bit far off from equality and a lot of the things that I had taken on board myself as being my fault were actually systemic problems that all women were facing. And so I absolutely see myself as a feminist today um, but I have a very diff different definition of feminism and even as a woman I think there is a very strange narrative around feminism for a lot of women I come from South Africa we are not a, a, a feminist empowered culture and so there is a yeah quite a negative narrative around it so that's my, sorry, a bit long-winded, but there we go. Let me, let me ask, thank you, Undine. Let me ask, uh, I may as well finish off the last two questions for you, because I think this is really important for everybody to, because I think it helps set the stage for what we're going to get into next. And I'm going to ask the other, uh, Anthony and Tim and whoever else is, is there to answer this too, because it's part of the learning. How, given that reflection, Undine, how has feminism practically influenced your life? Well, I have, I have really started to understand fundamental issues around um, how, for myself, I engage with the world and the, the world engages with me. And I really have, have begun to understand um, why, where to place um, my energies and efforts around um, working on improving outcomes for women in general. And so it's been great. I mean, it's informed a huge amount of my work, huge amount of the projects I have selected to be engaged with, a huge amount of people like yourself that I have push to work with because I want a greater depth of understanding. I have two daughters and now with eyes wide open, it's fundamentally important for me um, from a legacy perspective to have a voice in, you know, in, in this movement for change. Where do you go to learn about feminism? Um, I mainly read the, the things that you recommend I read. <laughs> um, so, 
yeah, good question. I think, I think, um, I mean, Lisbeth for me has been uh, of great insight um, in terms of connecting me to other authors, other blog, uh, bloggers, other sources of, um, of information. Um, yeah. And, and just general research. But I mean, I've actively started looking. It's not like I've never actively looked before for, for um, information on feminism or, or specific contexts of feminism um, until the last five years. So join Lizbeth if you haven't. Shout out. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Andine. Who wants to go next? Because I can't see you. <laughs> um, I, I can, yeah, I can go just ahead. go next. Uh, Probably, I mean, slightly different perspective, although Undine has mentioned, especially from the time before she was uh, enlightened, so to say, um, a lot of things that that I kind of see similarly. I, I feel like I haven't had too many touch points with feminism so far, especially with, um, I mean, knowing other concepts um, as when you kind of dive into them, there's so much more to them than, than you see on the surface. And I feel like I've had a very superficial exposure to um, feminism so far. Um, so uh, to put it into very simple terms, I would say that um, to me so far it was um, mostly about equal rights for for women, and um, and in that sense, um, that's my relationship to feminism was always because I, I believe strongly in equal equal rights, not just for for, for women, but in in any sense, um, it was always something that I saw very positively. Um, yeah, so that was my relationship with feminism so far. I have to say, beyond the superficial kind of things you see, um, there, there wasn't too much. Um, so I was just thinking how it might have influenced my life, other than that I think uh, the role of women in society has changed a lot since, uh, since I've been on this earth. Um, so it has definitely influenced my life in that sense. And I was just wondering if it maybe also influenced my life in the way that maybe also through feminism now men don't have to um, fit certain stereotypes as much anymore as they uh, maybe have used to. Um, so, so I think it's not just a, um, if I may call it a, a movement that, 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 that only helps women, but also that helps men. Um, and, and to the last question, where do you go to learn about feminism? To be very honest, I, I so far have not gone anywhere to learn specifically about feminism. So I think here, um, that's also partly why I was very excited about, uh, about today's meeting. Um, I guess um, I would say here is where I come to learn about feminism. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, anyone else? Well, I'll just take one more and then go from there. Who wants to go next? Hello? <laughs> Turn your mic on as well, that would be good. Just push the button at the bottom, it should flash green. There you go, that's it. Yep, that's okay. good. Yep. Does that yep. work? Yep, that's working. Okay. So, um, so yes, Vlad, Vlad Thomas speaking. Um, Hi. I, um, I didn't know too much about feminism um, before my master's program. I took, I took a program in Austria and I, I remember one distinct um, um, academic that we used to read was uh, Judith Butler. And, um, and um, so I guess that was my introduction to feminism, which I found was interesting because um, it was closely related to um, um, Postmodernism as as a as a type of thought, and uh, I, I didn't really notice the um, the tie before that, and so that was I guess a, a, a big step of of understanding that for me. I um, her her theories um, I thought were were pretty interesting about how we we act who we are in a sense socially so, um, and through that uh, acting others then um, perceive us to be that. So in a way we kind of um, self-identify uh, was, was, was one of her theories, which I thought was, was really interesting. Um, um, how it's affected my life, I guess. Um, um, 
maybe maybe similar to to what Tim said. I think that if if indeed our identity is constructed through uh, a performance, then uh, of course we're able to uh, to become aware of that and shift that performance um, into a, what we feel it, uh, we are instead of maybe what societally is um, thought to be the case. Well, where do you go to learn now? Uh, I, I guess um, I, I haven't learned too much more about it ever since the pro, uh, my master's program, um, but um, but it, it, it would still be I think uh, in in academic writing um, where where I would um, mm -hmm. okay. be privy to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, thank you. So thank you all three of you for those reflections. I think what's interesting about what everyone is as about was, um, and this is quite common when I ask this question, is people don't think about themselves as having a relationship with feminism. Many people uh, do think of it as an angry uh, kind of space. It depends on what country you come from. If you're in North America, uh, and maybe some other countries as well, there's a certain perception of feminism that is different than it would be in Australia, New Zealand, and in other countries. So the important thing about feminism is but it doesn't, it, the way feminism evolves in the movement in each country is very different, right? So shaped by sort of what are the priority concerns of women in that nation at that moment in time. Um, and the other thing I think is interesting about what people have said, or back to uh, in terms of how it's influenced your life. I wonder sometimes if, uh, so I, I see this often, people forget that it influences their life in very small ways. Like for example, did you and your significant other, if, if you chose marriage or not, uh, have a conversation around whose last name would you take? Um, did you, uh, you know, did you divide your household duties? Did, did feminism in, inspire, uh, you have, as a couple to divide your caregiving work differently at home. So the influence of feminism has has had some day-to-day, -day, not just political stuff, but day-to-day -day imp imp impacts on people that may, they may not even realize uh, has there or is there. And in terms of where do people go to learn about feminism, the majority of people answer the media, which is probably the worst place you could possibly go to learn about feminism. And I'm just gonna go on to, uh, on to a couple of other slides. I, I want to talk about feminism as a, it's not one thing. Um, and it certainly doesn't manifest in every country in exactly the same way, because women's issues are different in some countries versus the, in, in other, you know, in various countries. So in terms of a typology of feminism, this is not the only one, I'm gonna show you two. Uh, but this is one attempt at sort of diagrammatically uh, looking at the waves of feminism and where we are today. So feminism has survived because it's a very dynamic, uh, robust movement that's always open to change. So it is not static. It is not 1970s broad burning, um, which by the way, if you don't know that story, uh, the broad burning incident, uh, if, I don't know how many of you were around in the 60s. Was anybody around in the 60s? <laughs> like at least 10 in the 60s? Um, but basically the bra burning is, bra bur burning things in barrels was very much a part of most of the protests happening in the 60s. People, if it was an anti-war protest, they would throw things in barrels and burn them. And so when uh, it was a, a women's rights protest, it was, it was similarly like, hey, we're having a protest outside of this building. It turned out to be in Washington and, or in New York, sorry. And it wasn't even a very large crowd, um, but there was a barrel and women threw things into it that symbolized femininity um, and that symbolized oppression to them. And it was set on fire. So the bra burning incident, which is interesting, uh, became symbolic of angry women throwing things in, into the fire that represented femininity and was kind of represented that way when really what they were doing was um, modeling how protest, you know, sort of happened in those days. That was a way of saying, we, we don't buy this anymore. 
And it is also quite thought to be the, the thing that stood for feminism, which it wasn't. It was, there were also magazines, there were shoes, there were a bunch of other things in there, but somehow the media got hold of that event, blew it up as a big thing, and that's all people remember. And I could go into a longer, if you would, are interested in the history of how, fe how feminism has been uh, portrayed in media, uh, mostly media owned by men, um, it has been a very lopsided, uh, um, very lopsided narrative around what feminism is about and, and uh, what feminism has always been about, which has been entirely frustrating to the feminist movement in North America. So all this to say that the media has played a significant role in villainizing feminism by taking bits and reporting it in a way that's deeply out of context. So that has influenced people's understanding of feminism. The other thing is feminism, like I say, has, it's like religion, right? You can't say there's Christianity. I mean, there's the right, there's right Christianity. There's all kinds of left Christianity. There's all kinds of uh, Christianity. And in any social movement, there's all kinds of dimensions to it. So if you look at this chart, what it's done is it's kind of said, okay, type of feminism around the definition of equality, definition of gender, and the root cause of inequality, which are three things that informs feminists, you know, various feminist uh, movements and various approaches to feminism across the globe. Um, in the first waves in the 1830s onwards, and this is mostly about Western feminism, let me say that, uh, the early stages was around equality. Uh, having women uh, have the right to have bank accounts, to, to own property, to vote, to be recognized as a person. You probably know that in Canada we have, uh, you know, National Persons Day, which was in October, which is the day that not all women, but white women, were finally recognized to be a person. And that was important because without being recognized as a legal person, you couldn't own property. So a lot of work in the early days was around equalizing the law. Um, later, and, uh, and of course, in the early days, it was always about gender was strongly linked and influenced by biology. If you had a vagina, you were a girl. If you had a penis, you were a boy. And those were the only two genders ever spoken about, even in those early days of feminism. Um, so then we move over to the, the right, and you get a different, uh, you can see how the movement has evolved to think about it in terms of, to move from the equality of opportunity for the individual, and in that case women, and, and moving towards the equality of outcome for the collective. And that's what differentiates radical socialist and intersectional feminism from libertarian and liberal feminism, which is much more about equality for me, as opposed to equality for all of us. And then if you go down where you see the outcome feminism kind of being where we are now, and actually we kind of see ourselves in the fifth wave at the moment, but guided by intersectional feminism, and there certainly doesn't mean there aren't liberal feminists out there, feminist groups, that there aren't radical feminist groups out there. We can talk about those. Um, but the shift has been towards, you know, the, I guess there's two, if you can see my hands, I could move this around a bit. Um, but there's this uh, tension between Feminism from an individual opportunity point of view and feminism as a as a way of achieving a better outcome for all and then the next level of conversation is about moving from thinking of gender as biologically determined to gender as a social construct and the root cause of inequality used to be around the laws and to on Dean's point uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress in terms of the legal system. It's not always interpreted in the way that women would like around, let's say, for example, harassment and all of those things and who we listen to and who we don't. But women have come a long way in terms of laws, at least in North America, not in all places. Um, and then moving on to looking at, okay, if, if we're looking for equality for if no one is free until everyone is free, type of intersectional collective uh, approach to feminism, then we can't help but look at capitalism because um, from an intersectional feminist point of view, it's the root cause of equality. And so is language. So you're now seeing a lot of language around, um, you know, we're deconstructing uh, gender as, a, as, as something that is socially constructed and uh, that we are, you know, I don't have to tell you guys this in terms of um, 
understanding gender as a binary. And not all feminist groups, by the way, uh, recognize intersectional feminism and th those kinds of beliefs are, are a sort of a portion of the movement that's moved in that direction. Uh, also, someone asked me today, what is intersectional feminism? And basically it's the recognition that we don't just have one form of oppression that we basically bring race, we bring class, we bring uh, ableism. Uh, there are a number of factors that can create uh, someone's lived experience and the types of oppressions that they, that they experience. So intersectional recognizes all forms of oppression and seeks to eradicate all forms of oppression. Um, I'm going to stop, I'm going to go on to the next one for a moment and then I'm going to stop and ask questions. There's another, uh, this is sort of a mind map around feminism and the different types of feminism from a different perspective. And the point in my t showing you these slides is just to show you, I want you just to take, not the definitions per se, but just to take away the idea that feminism is not a uni- homogeneous, you know, monolithic movement. It has many, many different parts to it or many different points of view, but where it's all connected for the most part is it's connected by um, seeking equality for, uh, for a larger group of people, for gender or all genders, um, depending on where, where you come from in the world of feminism. What differentiates a lot of feminist uh, groups from others is just the how, not the what. Um, Okay, so we have here uh, liberal feminism, uh, difference and postmodern feminism, radical feminism, and I want to talk about radical for a moment. Can anyone tell me what radical feminism means or what it brings to mind? If you close your eyes and don't look at the chart. I was going to say, um to me, it brings to mind a definition of somebody who potentially doesn't like feminism would give me the definition and they would classify it as radical as a way to sort of discount it as rebellious. Um, and, you know, so it was a threat. So they would classify it. So that's how I would interpret radical feminism. I don't think that's what it is. But that's how I would have been taught to classify something. Great. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to chime in? because I can't see anybody, so I don't know what's happening out there. <laughs> um, let me jump to the chase there a little bit and say, it's interesting because radical feminism was actually, the birth of it was basically uh, moving away from individual feminism to more a look at the systems that support inequality. So radical feminism in its original idea was around challenging larger systems. Uh, for example, capitalism and that kind of things. And of course it did break down into smaller movements. And certainly there were radical feminists that had ideas around what happens like political lesbianism and so on. What happens if we build communities and lives where there were absolutely no men in there? And these were like strategies for change as it points out here. But radical feminism uh, is distinguished from, let's say liberal feminism by liberal feminism being about me, the, I often think about it as the women's empowerment space, you know, how do I strengthen myself and how do I navigate myself in a world so I can be at an equal table to men versus radical feminism that says break the table. We don't want anybody around the table. The table is causing problems and, and we should be focusing on breaking the table in the spirit of creating a radically more inclusive world. Um, if you look at Marxist feminism, um, you'll see, you know, you'll see some similarities there. And I won't go through all the different pieces other than the idea that there are, again, there are many different types of feminism. And I just want to point out radical feminism I find so interesting because when I use that word, and I consider myself a radical feminist, uh, people think of it means that it's angry and unreasonable and, you know, all of those things. Uh, what's really radical about it is it's, it, it, it moves further away from, it, it, it's more systems oriented than the other forms of feminism. And what's interesting about that is when we think of radical artists, we love radical artists and we flock to them and we think of them as norm busting and stereotype busting and giving us a window on, uh, uh, giving us a chance to see other ways of viewing things. But when we think of radical feminism, we have this negative uh, perspective on it. So um, 
just thinking about how we like the word radical in some spaces uh, and we don't like the word radical in some other spaces. We don't think of those artists as angry. We think of them as radical in a good way, challenging the norms. Okay, so, um, oops. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I'm, and because of time, I'm, I'm actually gonna move a little bit more quickly because I wanna get to some of the other things. Um, so some of the key radical feminist idea is that not all women are feminists and not all feminists are women. Men can be feminists too. Not all feminists agree with that, by the way. Um, the other thing is inviting, sorry, there's a typo there, more women into a broken system is an example of how patriarchy limits our imagination. So feminism, uh, which examines inequality through the lens of gender, it also interrogates power, and power is a big part of feminist analysis. Um, when we talk about the feminist economy, uh, we're talking about, just like there's the green economy, we're talking about, uh, so the definition of a feminist economy is the aggregate of entrepreneurs, enterprises, nonprofit, for-profit, co-ops, et cetera, who are expressly um, working to advance uh, gender justice and uh, economic equality, or economic inclusion, by either the way that they run their business or the actual products and services that they offer. So, and I'm gonna to get to that in a moment, um, a little bit more. And I'm gonna to get to it right here. So Barbara Orser is an academic that's recognized around the world uh, as one of the top uh, 20 um, researchers on gender and feminist uh, Petra, so, so, sorry, just, just back to the previous slide for a second. Sorry, I had a trouble unmeeting myself. Um, one back. Mm -hmm. um, that 52% of GDP, um, that's public and private sector, or is it just private sector GDP? That's just uh, private sector GDP. Okay, okay. In Canada. I'm, 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 I'm surprised it's that low. Uh, yeah, okay, so when I say that is, that is outside of, so 92%, so 98% of incorporated companies are SMEs, right? Yeah, yeah, companies yes. Those are S. Uh, yes. That only makes up, that whole bucket makes up only 52% of GDP because in Canada we have a huge public economy, so what's not included in there is government and the civil, like, and, and the non, the non- Okay, okay. So that's why it's so okay. important. And okay. it also represents, I, oh, go ahead. I, I, I just bring it up. I, I need, the only reason I ask the question is what one of the theories of change of this group is that we, is exactly this last statement you've made here, that we've, we should be focusing on SMEs. Um, but I've always as, uh, understood the GDP of SMEs is, significant, is more than 52% of the private sector. So thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Yeah, that. no, that's in the context of the whole. If you look yep, at the yep. private sector piece, then it would be it's it's it would be bigger. I think it's around seventy something percent. But okay. what okay. we okay. talk about here in the world of feminist enterprise and feminist yep. um, entrepreneurship is that there's so much emphasis on how corporation large corporations are you know are working to, for advancing diversity and inclusion, but they will only go so far. There's just a ceiling that's there based on they're part of a system that they're looking to that they they don't want to challenge because it's their very existence. And we were just having a conversation here today at Idea Boost around how they've been working for nine years to get more women into this accelerator program. And they feel like what's limiting them now is the model, not the marketing, not the invitation, not the effort. And at some point, I thought that was a great microcosm of the larger picture. There's only so much inclusion and diversity that can be generated by corporate policy and government policy without changing the system uh, more broadly. Okay, so is it okay if I go to here? Anthony? Yeah, he's gone? Okay. Anyways, I wanted to share with you Barbara Orser's work because, and I'm now moving from the broad world of feminism into uh, entrepreneurship and the SME world. And what she's done is she's looked at the gendered nature of venture creation and came up with, yay, a four square chart. Because if you've been to MBA school, we love four square charts. 
And uh, so what she has done is created a typography that, that has um, put businesses in different in four different buckets. So high, you can see the continuums across the top, high masculine, high feminine, high social, high financial. And basically she says, you know, she would argue that 80%, 90% or 80% or so of businesses fall into the high masculine, high financial, neoclassical enterprise type. You know, I'll find that more in a moment. And um, to some extent, so there are high social, that you can have a high social, high masculine uh, type of business. And then you ha have high feminine relational businesses and then feminist enterprises. So neoclassical enterprises focused on maximizing shareholder wealth, revenue growth and profit, and governance is typically centralized through private ownership. Social enterprises in her, in her taxonomy here is around um, combining social and community benefit with long-term earned value and uh, financial sustainability, purpose-led, mission-led companies can come in there. But she would also argue that many of them have very high masculine cultures. Just because you're a social enterprise doesn't mean you've walked away from a more patriarchal approach to running a business, um, hierarchical, all of those things. Um, then if we go to the high feminine side, and um, we have relational enterprises. And here you find a lot more um, women at running relational types of enterprises. So relational enterprises embrace shared leadership, collaboration, co-opetition, diversity, inclusion, networks, and partnerships. There are many, this doesn't mean that this is a women's enterprise. I want to make that clear because many male-owned enterprises employ feminine traits to run their businesses very successfully. When we say masculine and feminine, we're talking about a set of traits that any gender can have and any human can have in any mix. And any business can also be uh, more led by feminine traits or more led by masculine traits, regardless of the gender of the person who runs it. The last one is the feminist enterprise. And here we've got uh, enterprises that specifically focused on generating equity and equality for equity seeking groups, um, differentiated by purpose and or operational policy and approach. And when we talk about the feminist economy, this is the group of enterprises we're talking about. They can be for-profit, non-profit, co-ops, whatever, but they are businesses that are specifically focusing on advancing gender justice uh, and uh, by extension, economic inclusion in some way. Um, these are some examples. Uh, so some of you from other places in the world wouldn't recognize these entrepreneurs, but um, so they're all women, but they're not all feminist uh, entrepreneurs or feminist enterprises. And the one that fits that model is, in this example is Luna Pads. And it's not because they're running a, a, a you know, a menstruation product, right? That's not what makes them a feminist business. The fact that they have for 20 years been acknowledging that all genders menstruate, by the way, they also men menstruate as well. Don't get me going on. Everybody says, oh my God, does that really happen? Yes, it really happens. But they were the first company to try to build a narrative and a, uh, a website and a way of communicating with people that didn't shame people who were uh, in transition or who were born uh, with a certain way where they also needed this type of, um, this type of product. And uh, so they were very innovative in their day and still are today. They're still a multi-million dollar business today running out of Vancouver. But um, there are now many uh, businesses dealing with, um, you know, what I call the period industry. But um, they were one of the very first and it wasn't all about women. This is a chart of some of the feminist enterprises that exist in, in Canada. There are many, many more. I just wanted to create a slide that indicated, and they're not feminist enterprises because there are women either leading it or owning it. They are feminist enterprises because of the type, the, the operational approach they take and the, and the products and services that they, they offer and provide. And you'll see venture companies in there too. Uh, if you're not familiar with Audre Lorde, this is one of the uh, writers and thought leaders I'm gonna highly recommend that you read. She is, uh, a, she is one of feminism, no matter what angle you come at it from, she is one of the core texts. She has many texts, but the core sister outsider is 
one of the core texts that everyone should probably read. And this is her famous, famous quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, moving into feminist business tools and practices, you'll see the different, um, different uh, business model canvases here. And one of the reasons I think this is such an important slide is when people say, you know, why do we, you know, so what about feminist business practice? What can it contribute to the conversation? And you'll see the strongly sustainable and flourishing business canvas here as well. I've had the opportunity to teach um, groups, a group of MBA, second year MBA students at Rotman three times now uh, in, their, in their design course. Um, and uh, every time I, there are about 50 students in the room. So here's what happens. Every time I go into that class, um, I ask them if they have ever seen the a business model canvas. And if you can believe this in a world-class MBA business school, 90% of them have never seen a business model canvas, right? And that's because they're not learning about entrepreneurship. They're learning about how to be consultants at BCG and stuff like that. That's what they really want. So they're not really learning about entrepreneurship stuff. So which is good because I wanted them to go in blind. So then what I did is I broke... Pet Pet Petra, I, I just wanted to add a, a color comment there. Um, you remember we, we did that thing back in 2015 at Queen's University and had a very similar reaction. I yes. think that was several hundred people in the room. Um, right. But it's, big, it's bigger than just, it's not just because they're not teaching them entrepreneurship. It's because they're not teaching business as a design discipline. They're teaching business as an analytical discipline where it's all about forecasting and analysis and numbers. It's not about design and emotion and values. And, and that's why they don't teach it. It's because they're fundamentally, and business schools have lost the plot. Let's, let's not kid ourselves here. <laughs> well, on so, on so many different fronts. Yes, I agree okay. with that. And so, yeah, they've never seen a business model, camp, like a basic business, even a high school student these days, I think, sees business model campus. But anyway, um, so what's interesting about uh, doing this, so I divide this. So the first thing is they know nothing about business model campuses. So then I divide the group into three in this case. I know there's four canvases here, but let's focus on the three. I divide them into three and I tell them all that in the next two hours, we're gonna design a lemonade stand business, a lemonade drink business. And I give them that only, they don't know the names of these canvases. I don't call one the feminist business model canvas, the flourishing and the Osterwalder, and they're all just the way they are um, right here. And then I give them some, uh, you know, teaching notes, like basically what are the definitions of the various boxes and things like that. Um, and so each group has a different model. And then after two hours, they're supposed to present and pitch their business. So here's what happens invariably in all cases. The Osterwalder group comes back with a very basic definition of a business. You know, here's, we're gonna make the best lemonade ever. Uh, we're going to sell it through these channels. Um, you know, we're going to uh, engage with our customers that, and these are the activities, these are the resources, here's our partners, and we're going to make a lot of money and we're going to, you know, here's our cost structure and that's it. That's basically all they got. And their value proposition is we're going to make the best lemonade. Um, when we get to the flourishing group, uh, they end up talking about without any guidance from anywhere else other than what this canvas intuitively tells them to think about is that uh, they talk about the, um, the health of the lemon trees and what, ha what climate change is going to do to the lemon farms and how they're going to build a sustainable big company around you know, the possibility there might be fewer and fewer and very expensive lemons. So they end up looking and their business model ends up being an entirely different thing because they're gonna invest in R&D to help figure out how to, in some one case, how to clone lemons. I'm not sure exactly how they, but they built this idea into this, into their business model, into their pitch presentation around how they were gonna be a sustainable, thriving business for investors because they had recognized this and they were going to address it when other people wouldn't. Um, so, and then the feminist business model canvas, which is on the far right, it says the feminist at work thing, they came back and talked about how they were going to work with farmers. Uh, they were going to prioritize, uh, you know, women farmers. It doesn't say women on here at all. It doesn't even say feminist business model canvas when they got it. But somehow, when they looked at social social needs, expressive solutions, um, values, and all these other kinds of things, they came up with an entirely different plan that somehow fit gender in there, and. 
So what that tells us, and I've done it three times now, and I don't know, Anthony, if you've done it since the Queen's experiment, but um, what it, the message to the group was, the tools that you use to design a business matters. And that there is, you shouldn't be using one tool. You should try your business, uh, try to articulate your business in more than one tool so it can surface for you different perspectives that can help you build resilience into your business and also help you, you know, create a more thriving, uh, equitable business where the planet and the people do well. So I just thought each time I do it, it never fails, but it, it shows us the tools used matters. And unfortunately, the tools used to teach entrepreneurship tends to be the Osterwalder campus. Uh, and even in, in high-end accelerators, they're still using that type of approach. So it's all this to say that I think that we're teaching entrepreneurship in a very in a way that reinforces a damaging system as opposed to encouraging them to consider designing models that um, don't damage people and planet this so, so petra petra does that does that mean uh, th this is evidence of the assertion that language matters in your earlier slide i mean is that basically what this is saying or is, is there something else in here as well that you think we're uncovering I think it says language matters by, uh, because it evokes different responses from people. When you ask people about, you know, a channel, uh, you're going to think about marketing channels. You'll notice that it doesn't say channel. Uh, it does say channel on, the fem on this one, but it doesn't say it on the, on the feminist business model canvas because the feminist business model canvas forces you to look at different things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the words matter, but also the emphasis that you place on different aspects of designing a business leads you to designing um, an enterprise that prioritizes different things. Does that does that help? Like here's yeah, a I, 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 absolutely. And I, I I did want to also say because uh, thank you for sharing that story, Petra. I, I've now uh, heard this, heard this story a few times now, and um, it gets better in, in each telling. Um, and I think it's I think I think this uh, finding needs to be shared more widely. So um, I'm I'm keen to see how could we you know get this get this um, these observations that you've been making f duplicated by some other people in the group um, and 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 also uh, written up in some way. Yeah, um, I would love that. I, that would be I, I, I think we should we should try and figure out how how to do that. Yeah, and the key is not tell them what the campus is, right? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. And um, what I want to point out, what I've learned about working with the Feminist Business Model Canvas and what made, what it tends to bring, if this was a, you know, a type, a 3D model, then the three canvases would have different typologies, right? There'd be different mountains and different valleys, if you want to visualize it that way. And what the Feminist Business Model Canvas brings out most is emotion, uh, and the role of emotion and how, how we want our customers to feel and how we want them to experience um, the company and the product in ways that makes them feel valued, heard, and all of that. So there's, it brings out different things. And it also, I think the other thing that's unique about it is it talks about non monetary value streams, which you'll see at the bottom, you'll see re revenue streams across the, the conversation around non-monetary value streams is a big one. It's also a canvas that brings out the theory of change. And I know you guys do a lot of work in that area as well. But I think between the flourishing business model canvas and this one, you'll notice the feminist business model canvas does not ask you to consider the environment or the broader context, right? So it very much looks at, um, Helping people who've been, it recognizes that a lot of, uh, let's say, women and a lot of other uh, populations have been traumatized by being excluded and by not having the same opportunity that other people have. And if you wanted to build a business that, that addresses those things through the way you run your business or the products and services you offer, these are the things you need to think about. So that's how it's different. And, um, and it, you know, it's not a replacement for other things, but it draws out different things. And if you are building a business that is targeting, uh, you know, targeting, um, I shouldn't say the word targeting, but basically is designed 
to appeal to people who've experienced, ex uh, you know, tr um, uh, exclusion uh, because of race, uh, background, gender, etc. Paying attention to the things that this model asks you to pay attention to really makes a big difference. Okay, so this is CV, a picture of her, and it basically she. This is a, a quote I pulled from her, uh, and this is one of her points of view, which is why use old tools when we know it led to a broken system. And I think the flourishing group kind of gets that as well, because you're not using old, old tools either. And um, businesses can be profitable and feminist at the same time. Uh, most of it reinforces patriarchal models of thinking and operating by design. I want to bring out uh, a story that I think is really important when people say, well, what is the difference between a feminist business and just a good, caring business? And here's an example. Um, I don't know if some of you have followed the equal voice controversy in Canada. Any, uh, Anthony or Andine, did anybody read about that? Um, equal Voice is a nonprofit organization with a very laudable goal. Its, it's, its existence is about advancing women in politics, helping more women get into po Canadian politics to run for office. And it's been around for about eight, nine years. Great idea, uh, run by mostly cis white women. And uh, nothing wrong with the vision. Well, of course, they were all white women. And so about three years ago, they really wanted to, um, you know, become more intersectional in their approach. And they hired a lot of women of color and also younger women. And when the Daughters of the Vote thing came up, uh, you know, in Parliament, I don't know if you guys remember that whole controversy where a lot of the women sat down, um, et cetera. It turns out that... Uh, you know, a lot of these folks were, were part of the Equal, Equal Voice, uh, actually curated that event. And then uh, I'll cut to the chase. Um, they, fired, uh, uh, they fired several of the women of color in their organization, basically for not being team players. And the women who were in the organization said, this is the least feminist organization. It's run by women, but it's the least feminist organization I've ever been involved in. Why? Because the way Equal Voice was run, was a top-down, hierarchical, power-based thing. You know, I'm in charge, you're not towing the line, you're out of here. And so there was an inability to do deep listening, there was an inability to find a way to, to leverage that, the, the tension as a way to innovate. There was a, there, you know, there, you can't just invite people to the table and then expect them to shut up. Uh, and that's what was happening. And I think I use that example now as an example of a woman-led enterprise, but not a feminine, feminist enterprise, because um, their I, definition of inclusion and diversity was inviting people to the table, but not really, you know, as long as they behaved at the table the way they were supposed to, then that was okay. As soon as they didn't, they could not be at the table anymore. Anyways, as an outcome of that whole thing, um, their funding is at risk and they have basically imploded. And I, only, I don't know that they're gonna survive. So I use that as an example to say, there's a big difference between a women-led organization, because not all women are feminists and not all feminists are women, uh, and, and how feminist um, thinking and the things we've learned through feminism can help us really transform the way business works and rethink how we do business. And in that organization, even though it was focused on advancing women, wasn't doing it in a way, well, anyway, they, they, they you know, they, they didn't succeed. Um, I, I wanted, I know I'm sensitive to time here, it's 537 and I wanna leave time for questions. I wanted to share this with you. This is kind of how, uh, we at Evolution look at feminist um, business practice. Obviously, similarly to the sustainable business model canvas world or sustainable business model group, we want flourishing for all. The things that we focus on are the red petals and we take a strong look at governance practices and alternative governance models. We look at whole humanness, meaning uh, we understand that humans are more than just workers. Um, social justice is a core, Thing. And I think of it as a little bit different in that way in how this sustainable business model works because I see it as a sustainable business model group as more planet ecologically focused, although there's a social justice dimension in there as well. Um, and then, of course, around gener generativity, 
that everything you do, one plus one doesn't equal two, one plus one has to equal five. And then uh, lastly, the notion of ecosystems and webs of relationships, how to map them, how to relate to them, how to manage it, and how to build connections between ecosystem players as, as um, and, and you know, not always with yourself in the middle. So, um, and of course, this whole flower sits in the patriarchy, <laughs> the soil, and the feminist leadership mindset are the roots below. So that's basically what this diagram uh, indicates. I have an example here of how we use the feminist uh, ecosystem mapping tool. And uh, what's interesting about the mapping tool, in my uh, humble opinion, is we look at non-traditional experts like grassroots organizations, bloggers, politicians, activists, thought leaders, as part of business circle, often when I see business ecosystem, it's usually about competitors. You know, who's our competitor and who should we go after? This is a, a different approach and looks at everyone as a possible uh, opportunity for innovation, even if they are a competitor, as a possible ally or as someone to connect to, or as, you know, how can we play a role in connecting three of these other players to create something completely different? I put this last piece in here to, uh, I'm now heading we're very quickly into some people you should know about if you haven't read about them already or know about them. So in the startup ecosystem, very there are virtually no women thought leaders on how to build a business uh, usually referenced. And even in the course I teach at Rotman right now, every single example and quote of a successful entrepreneur, and try, try this yourself, for, type in successful entrepreneur quotes in Google and you'll get all guys, all men. And so, you know, uh, so one of the things we're trying to do in the work that we do is teach accelerators and incubator programs and entrepreneurship 101 programs to incorporate feminist thought, business thought leaders. And one of that is Mary Parker Follett. And she's the person who start, you know, sort of is the brain behind power to power over power with power within and power under which actually one of the books is a new power book by jeremy hyman i guess actually took this work without referencing it um actually cv hardwell good story behind that told him about it and said you you know these are mary parker follett's this is her work and you haven't even referenced it and then later he did like he actually uh in a reprint put it back in like basically said this is taken from the work of Mary Parker Follett. Um, I also have a list here which you could look at later as some of the, the programming and courses that you're programming in there that is, uh, is relevant to the feminist business space. And lastly, I need to tell you about two amazing thinkers that everybody here should read. One is uh, Octavia Butler. Some of the things, one of the things we talk about a lot is what does a feminist future actually look like? We know what inequality looks like, but what is it, what is, what is an entirely different world look like um, from a, a non-gendered point of view? If you haven't read, Octavia Butler is a American sci-fi writer. She's the kind of the grandmother of Afrofuturism, totally feminist, and you've just got to read all of her books. Uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. And the last one, ah, I can't move my slide. I don't know why. Can anyone tell me why I can't move my slide? Uh, Wait, I think I know why. Ah, there. The other one is uh, uh, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's written the book uh, Emergent Strategy, which should be part of everyone's bookshelf, and also a, a social justice-based futurist book. Basically, she got um, a number of writers in the social justice space to write short stories about what better future should look like. It's called Octavia's Brood because it's built off of Octavia Butler's books. These are some of the principles from emergent strategy and I, I think you'll see connection with a lot of the work that you do and, um, and, and how, so I think there'll be some overlap, but I think it's important to start bringing in these, these amazing thought leaders into, in, into, the, into this work. And then um, the parable is of the sower is the one that I recommend you start with because it also is heavily engaged with ecofeminism. Uh, lastly, there's some articles that I thought I would encourage you all to read. And then there's the last slide, Connect With Us. And we are starting a new, uh, just a little bit about Elizabeth. We're up to um, 2,600 uh, subscribers and we have about 14,000 readers on our, on our website each month. 
and uh, we are starting the Feminist Business Com Enterprise Commons as a non-Zuckerberg space on Mighty Bell to have to continue for those people who want to deepen their conversation and, and uh, explore feminist business practice more deeply, which is hard to do on Twitter or and I refuse to I'm moving. I'll use Facebook for advertising, but I'm not hosting my community there <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, you may know this, but femi uh, because of the election, uh, any, any post boosts with the word feminist in it were blocked. And uh, I found, and we were put in the same category as white supremacists, but not Lisbeth itself, but we're part of the same algorithm that's, that roots out white supremacist groups and things like that. So if it's, because I wrote back and forth, I won't tell you the whole story, but feminism was seen as dangerous. And therefore, anything that mentioned feminism in an election time was prevented from being boosted. Even something like, we're a feminist uh, entrepreneurship community. Join us, connect with us. Like we're not talking any political advertising here. So that's just a little weird. All right, so that's my presentation. I know that's sort of a really rough journey through, through everything. Um, any questions? So, so um, f first of all, thank you. Uh, th this has been a really uh, useful um, and comprehensive update from a lot of different perspectives, Petra. So thank you for that. Uh, and I know you did this at quite short notice for us. So th thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. Um, second, uh, and, and thank you to Andine as well, I should say, for, for uh, making the suggestion that we get you, get you back uh, to do that. So, so good on, 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 on Dean there as well. Um, I, I guess, um, so we, we should, uh, you, you've, you've highlighted it, if it wasn't already obvious, that, that there should be more connections between our community um, and the, the, the feminist uh, business community. Um, and um, so, yes, let's definitely put a, a, a note to, to selves to uh, figure that out over the next uh, month and uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to operationalize that a little bit more. Um, but um, I, I, I do want to say, and this is just a general message to all members, you know, this is a group for members by members, um, with members. So if you've got something to share and you think that, you know, based on the five or six different threads that we have in our vision and mission, uh, that you think that what you're doing is interesting, just go ahead and share it. You don't need an invitation from me uh, or from Tim or anybody else. If you think that we should, we should know about it, uh, just go ahead. There's, there's no 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 worries about that. Um, I, I guess what I'm curious about, Petra, is, is where do you see um, the the feminist business movement and and your work within that going over the next pick a time frame that you you'd like to talk about, um, and um, what, what should we be on the lookout for as that journey unfolds? Okay. Well, two things I'd like to share are, along that. One is I, I am. I'm a, I believe that feminism has a lot to offer as a body of work that can inform anyone else's work around, because I, I see us all, a lot of different movements, whether it's the localist movement, we're all working with the same kind of truth, which is we need to find a better way to be in this world and to do less harm. So, but we come at it from different angles, right? So feminism starts with gender, uh, you know, the e ecological environment side starts with the environment, and then we have the democratic economy folks, which starts with ownership and how to distribute wealth more equitably, like there's all these different, so I feel like we're, it's a world of movements right now, but there's many of us who are all working towards the same center, which is great, because we want all these different perspectives to inform each other's work. Um, so with that in mind, I'm always trying to practice and, and try out the theories in real life through my own business, which is the Elizabeth Media Company. So one of the things, and Anthony, I know you'll be totally thrilled by this. Um, I actually originally incorporated, I set it up as an incorporated B company that became B, Cert, B Corp certified my second time around, but I'm actually leaving the B Corp space because I don't think it's going far enough. I know that's heretical, maybe in some places. I love B Corp and was, you know, my fifth town was the eighth uh, Canadian B Corp, but um, I'm finding the, the, the conversation isn't pushing far enough for me in terms of, uh, you know, where we need to break the systems, not figure out how to incrementally shift them so that they do less harm. I think there is a ceiling to, I, we need to hit that ceiling. That's great if more people do that. 
So I'm I'm shifting I'm I'm shifting um, I'm reincorporating Lisbeth to be a multi-platform cooperative, <laughs> and um, I hope you'll be the first member there, Anthony. Uh, and working with Brian Eiler, who's also you know worked with Kid, uh, Center for Social Innovation, uh, he's a leading expert in the co-op field to figure out how to be we would be the first media organization to be a reader-based co-op. Uh, with different um, membership categories. So that's the first thing. I'm, try I'm always trying to try these things out and see how they work in practice. The second thing I wanted to say that um, we are launching the very first Feminist Accelerator program in Canada in connection with the Canadian Film Centre and Idea Boost, which has had an accelerator program for digital entertainment media companies uh, for nine years and been very successful. Um, but we have the license now to try to create a feminist business accelerator. So we, we're just getting started. So I, I would love to keep you in touch with what we're grappling with there. It's hard, you know, will people come? Uh, some of the women have already said in digital media, I don't want to be part of it. Are you going to turn me into a feminist? I, I'm just trying to grow my business. And some of these things that, we, that we're that we working with, but i um, happy to share the journey and hopefully we'll learn things out of doing this. It's a three year program that uh, we'll be able to share with other people. And uh, yeah, so it's entirely lab oriented and uh, we hope to affect 150 women led businesses. Um, but, and they can have male co-owners and all, it's not an anti-male thing. They, Obviously, males are invited too, but it's taking a very feminist approach to building enterprises. And can I just chime in to say we're also uh, at Lean for Flourishing working closely with Petra um, in looking at all the uh, Lean for Flourishing work and its relationship to feminism. We're also building out a two, well, an incubation and accelerator program um, in collaboration using uh, the flourishing. Uh, methodologies um, with a feminist lens for social entrepreneurs and that's also a three-year project that we we've just kicked off uh, in collaboration with Petra so um, some great work happening on that front as well and let me just say Anthony I would love to if there's a formal way like if there was a way that we could sit down with the people at CFC Media Lab and let's say some folks from Lead for Flourishing and maybe not right now, because we're still working it out, but let's say in a few months or maybe, you know, let's say June next year to sort of share what we're all learning by doing this stuff and uh, refining, you know, what we mean and, and, uh, and look, working with the language and, and all that, what we're going to learn by working with 50 women who are going to be part of this in the, fall, in the spring, um, what we can learn from that. I think that would be an, an incredibly useful uh useful you know thing <laughs> i have a question um, I, I just i just want to say first of all in response to petra's invitation yes okay <laughs> that would be great and cv's involved in this too so we don't I have to figure it out you know we're still all we know is that feminism is a mountain of insight and interesting practices and pedagogies that have been overlooked and we are trying to unearth all that in the service of trying to make a better, you know, trying to make a world that's, uh, that's um, that, that, you know, that can help, well, so that if everyone can flourish uh, in it. In, in, indeed. And, and CV has, has been on the call for most of the last hour. Uh, in fact, she's still here. And, and she has chatted, put in a few chat messages as well, oh. uh, Petra. So she, she, she has been uh, paying attention. Oh, Andy, good. go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I have a question. Um, because you know we're, we're, we're working a lot in the sustainability the SDG space and there are not a lot of women involved in this space um, proportionately to the number of men in the space and I'm I'm just wondering from your perspective Petra what do you think some of the barriers for women working um, or moving into um, working more around sustainability may be what, what are the barriers around women working in sustainability? What those might be? I, I'm going to say this. Involved, that, involved in the movements or um, because it's very, yeah. very male dominated. And when I had my dairy and was much more heavily involved in the sustainability space, and this might be Toronto centric or Ontario centric, 
but it was very male led, very male based. And I think it comes out of the clean tech, the notion that it's about technology. Uh, and as soon as you have it about having it about technology, you tend to, you know, somehow the men, so the you know, clean space, the clean, it, the sustainability space seemed to be full of solar panel engineers and, you know, all these kinds of people. And uh, I don't think there were a lot of women in those. So the, this very sector of clean energy, clean technology already doesn't have a lot of women in it. And so it doesn't invite, so if you have a sustainability group, you, you don't kind of get women showing up. I think if you had an eco-feminist, uh, you know, sort of language and group and connect with eco-feminism, you would get a ton more women into this conversation that you're holding here and but then you're talking about not technology you're talking about birth and wisdom and moon cycles and all kinds of other stuff but um i, I think that should be there, there should be a bridge because that community is huge and it's out there so they're in the sustainability space but they're not in the technology sustainability Um, I, I think um, it would be really good to figure out some ways we could proactively try and make some of those bridges because uh, I, I, I think the, um, and I'm talking from the perspective of this group and, and this community because um, although the word sustainability is in the name of this group, um, the word strong before it, if you look at the ecological economic literature where they define it, it clearly understands that this is about people. People have to come first and the environment needs to support the people and then the economy needs to support the environment and the people. It's in that order and so I've, um, fun fundamentally that's the approach that we've been trying to take. Now that as usual language gets in the way of conveying some of those more complex ideas but I, I, I agree Petra that the um, this group has always been about people first, and it has to be. So, and I figuring out how do we make those connections. Yeah, I would love, if I could leave you with one note, check out Tree Sisters as one, we did an article about that. And they're worldwide, they're global. Um, and there's a, there's a chapter here, but I, why not reach out and invite some of the eco-feminist thought leaders to participate in these conversations? And, you know, I, I don't know where it goes from there, but I think that could be a very interesting, um, interesting space. And I'd also like to see more Indigenous folks at this table because there's a lot of, I mean, the environment is first and foremost in a lot of the, which I know you guys know, uh, is first and foremost in a lot of the considerations. And I think that could strengthen the conversation as well. And there's some very strong uh, Indigenous environmental activists, um, women and men, who I think would be interesting to invite to the table. If you haven't already. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think, I, I think specifically around this group, there has been a very big struggle to draw in um, any form of diversity. It's, it's, it's been a struggle and it's not been a, a lack of willingness and it's certainly not been a lack of um the work being exclusive the work is highly inclusive yeah. um, it's you know there, there seems to be a barrier to accessing diverse groups especially women um and we've been working on in you know our relationships with indig indigenous right. communities as well but I mean, still, i think there's a there's a there is definitely something that is um um a real struggle from an accessibility perspective, and it, I think it would be worthwhile mm. maybe the group um, exploring this a little more. Yeah, deeper. how I, I would mean, recommend I... tackling that. Just I'm going to say this one last thing, and then I got to go because my Uber is here. Um, but I would tackle this. Lots of people tackle this problem by by then saying, "Well, let's reach out to these groups and let's invite them." I think you have to go to them. So Elizabeth is getting increasingly successful at bringing in all other groups because I, I go out and attend their meetings. And we, you have to build authentic bridges and relationships with people. Yeah. And um, so I would 
maybe make a list of five or six of these organizations, let's say in Canada, that you want to get connected to. But before you reach out and say, hey, come to our thing, go to their thing and uh, support them and then start those relationships and start that. And then all of a sudden, there's less of a, hey, you know, we're, you know, they're calling us because we're a women's organization. So, you know, we, it's not our job to educate everybody. So whatever, like support them first and then you'll get authentic uh, relationships happening. So it might take a bit of time, but that's one way of doing it. Yeah. Th thank you, Petra. That's very, very sound advice. Um, uh, and I know you have to go. So if you do need to drop off, uh, feel free. Thank you again, Petra, for, for being here. Uh, and uh, I, will, I, I will figure out how we can talk so that we can book a time for us to follow up on some of these topics in the next weeks. Thank you so much for having me and great. Uh, I really admire all the work that you are all doing. It's fantastic. And I, I do, I, I, you know, I owe a great debt to all the insight that I've learned from Anthony and all of you over the last couple of years. So it's also informed this work. So thank you. You're, you're welcome. Um, if I, I, we still have a few minutes uh, before, oh no, we are actually on the hour. So I, let's call it to call, call a close to it at this point and respect our timeline. So thank you again, Petra. Uh, next month, um, probably the talk is going to be about, uh, hang on, where's the camera? Oh, there's my camera there, uh, is going to be about uh, this book, Rethinking Strategic Management. Um, we're hoping to have a couple of different presenters who have got book cha uh, chapters in here um, around uh, flourishing enterprise design and strategy. Uh, so that's, I hope, what we're going to pull off the next month. Uh, but uh, stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll be able to advertise it a little bit uh, earlier in the month as well than we did manage to do this time. But anyway, thank you all very much. See you all in a month's time. And uh, recording and slides will be posted by Tim uh, into the SSBMG, to the post about this uh, meeting in the next, uh, well, probably by tomorrow, given it's quite late for Tim now. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>